morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for this video conversation uh, with, uh, between BDO here and Sarah Jones, who's very kindly joined me. Sarah's the Chief Financial Officer at Anchor Hanover to explore some of the themes uh, coming out of our fourth edition of our social housing barometer that we launched uh, towards the end of November, actually. Um, a very interesting time to be uh, surveying the sector about uh, key themes around economic confidence and risk and those sort of things, because clearly it's been a year unlike any other year and the impact of COVID on uh, the sector has been very marked in, in many different ways. And, and definitely that's one of the things that would be great to explore with Sarah just now. So uh, uh, maybe Sarah, could you say hello and a little bit about yourself? Indeed. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, Anchor Hanover is England's largest not-for-profit provider of housing and care for older people. So uh, yes, interesting is certainly one way of, of describing the year that we've uh, just had and of course that we're still going through. Um, so we were formed by a merger which completed um, legal at least in uh, November 2018. Uh, but the history of both organisations is very long. Um, it goes back more than 50 years. And uh, today we have around 50,000 customers in care and housing. We have around uh, 9,000 colleagues. Um, we're in 1,700 locations in 85% of local authority areas. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly been an interesting time for us with the services that we offer. So I use the word interesting and, um, and definitely my master of the understatement. I, I guess before maybe we go into some of the themes, it would be useful to just give a sense of that sort of immediate impact on an organisation like Anchor Hanover of COVID and, and what that meant for you. Mm. And I'm going to try very hard uh, not to use the word unprecedented apart yeah. from that time, because uh, as we know, it's, it's, it's a very, very much overused word. And um, I think the, the, the first thing that's uh, interesting to know is that although I won't claim to have put a pandemic into our stress testing analysis or anything like that at all, or our business continuity plans. We always make sure that we have multivariant tests. Our business continuity plans are really, really comprehensive. So although we hadn't anticipated this, we were in a really, really good position going into it. Um, so obviously the initial response was um, to particularly understand the impact on our cohort, so particularly from the care point of view. And of course, we could see, we did have a little bit of warning from uh, what was happening overseas. So we could sure. see the potential impacts that were coming to us. Um, and I think the huge advantage that we had, um, having built up our financial strength, um, just as a, a matter of policy over the years, but also, if I can mention another uh, unsayable word early on in the interview about Brexit, um, because we were anticipating having to have that extra resilience, that stood us in really good stead. And so what that enabled us to do was to look at the risks that the organisation faced, uh, those that were unique to us and those that were, I suppose, sector related as well, um, and to make decisions on those based on them being the right decision to make, rather than based around financial constraints or our expectation of how government might support us. So a good example of that was that we identified very early on that where you've got people who, um, if you if they have to self-isolate, they would go on to statutory sick pay. There are people for whom that would be impossible. Even if they felt unwell, they couldn't afford not to come into work. And we identified that really early. So before furlough became a word that we were all very familiar with and yeah. government launched that scheme, we uh, put our own discretionary sick pay scheme in there to support our care workers. So that sort of... Uh, ability to make that kind of decision and knowing that we had that robust financial position was really really helpful. So that's definitely about I, I guess playing that but that was around really understanding your uh, people who work with and for you and, and, and sort of understanding how that might impact on them I, yeah. I guess um, and that I assume that enabled them and to be better placed to work with the people clearly you you serve uh, what was the impact on I guess your service users and the people you work with. Um, I think obviously the, the really important thing for them is to uh, the, our our, um, our colleagues are a really important touch point for them. So I think it's uh, if, if your view of how care homes operate or indeed you know um, housing for older people operates is governed by the media, you'd have a very skewed view at the moment. I think about how that operates. Yeah. So certainly with care homes, for example, whilst it's it's really. Um, difficult for people uh, who want to see their relatives and for relatives in care homes who aren't seeing their families. Um, care homes are loving, nurturing, you know, best care homes are loving and nurturing, caring environments where there is a lot of lifestyle activity and 
it is very much better for people to be in those environments than, than to be isolated at home. So um, I think that was, uh, again, that, that underlying strength or, uh, and, and ethos of the organisation, how we run our care homes, um, and to a lesser extent, our housing um, is, is, uh, was really important. So the important thing for us was to support our colleagues so they could feel confident in maintaining that business as usual while everything else around them was in, in such a state of flux. You used to have confidence there, I think. And certainly, I guess, one of the themes of the barometer itself is around Yes, it's a decrease, uh, probably a, a very obvious and unsurprising decrease of confidence in the economy and, and those sort of things. How did that, how did that play in terms of, I guess, Anc Hanover's confidence overall in terms of, I guess, your strategy, your resilience and, and those sort of things that you're talking about? Um, yeah, so I think uh, obviously we know that there is a huge demand uh, sector wide for our services, um, uh, more than we could fulfil really. Um, I think particularly for our service, because we look after older people, um, regardless of what is happening uh, in the current situation, we recognise that the underlying fundamentals that dictate our strategy and allow us to have confidence moving forward into the future are unchanged. Um, you know, a lot of facts that people will be very familiar with, you know, one in four of us uh, will be over 65 by 2037. Um, and it's something that's really important to our organisation as well. We do talk in terms of us. Um, it's quite easy to um, other older people by talking yeah. about they all the time as if they're a, a, a different cohort altogether, when really um, it is all of us just in a matter of time. Um, and so we want to build services that, 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 that all of us would be, would be happy uh, to, to be living in. So I think um, those demographics are unchanged. Um, the need for our services is unchanged. The need for there to be a range of services as well. So um, we're all living longer and that is a cause for celebration. You know, as often as is referred to in a negative way, you know, the pensions time bomb and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, you know, it's pretty good news that we're all, we're all living longer, but we have to be realistic that not all of those years will be lived um, in, in good health. So we focus on services that allow people to live longer independently, happily and healthily, but have that care support as well for those who, who really need it which is really important none of those fundamentals have changed despite yeah, okay. you know, the, the huge uh, impact that we've seen this year so is this sort of short sharp shock i guess in a sense but actually that hasn't changed the fundamentals of business strategy the fundamentals of what you're here for the fundamentals of the things you want to achieve into the long term i guess or the medium term I think that, that's absolutely right. I mean, in a way, we're hoping it will help because it has drawn things like social care funding into a sharper focus again. Whereas, yeah. it, you know, every so often it comes around and then it drifts back into the background again. It's, it's absolutely up there, as is with recognition of care workers as being so important. Um, you know, not not uh, you know not just these sort of low skilled, um, underpaid workers that they can often be considered to be. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting, actually. Um, um, and I think your point you made earlier about the way perhaps there's a public perception of care and the public perception of what care homes do. And yeah, I, I do agree with you. I think you can see that it's, it's we are hitting that time where it's becoming, people are becoming more aware, I think, perhaps uh, of it all. And, and so possibly an opportunity, as you say, rather than just a short, sharp threat, threat as, as we perhaps have got lulled into just thinking about, isn't it dreadful at the moment? So. Definitely, and that we, you know, we did a lot of work around uh, Remembrance Day in particular, because that's yeah. really important to so many people in our care homes. Um, we've had some fantastic support externally as well. We had Catherine Jenkins doing a, a special live stream wow. into our homes, uh, doing some, there, there have been some wonderful, wonderful activities. And as I say, genuinely, there are fantastic friendship bubbles within those homes yeah. and the, the staff are, are, are amazing. And um, we use uh, Workplace in our organisation, which is the, you know, the business Facebook. And that has been invaluable in terms of, uh, of, of communicating two way with our colleagues that are out there, but also we can see best practice and we can see the wonderful things that are going on in there, which is, is, is really, really helpful. Because I say, if you, if you have a view through a certain lens of the media, you can get a very distorted picture of, of, of what's going on in there. I guess one of the other things that the barometer is then we always we always ask uh, people who respond to problems about their views of risk and the things that um, I guess are most pertinent and most at the forefront of the mind of the board or the organization and 
did COVID and the impact of COVID change that view of risk or risk appetite to the organisation at all? Um, what we did was um, we immediately set up a, a, a separate but parallel uh, COVID risk register. Um, because clearly everything within the risk register, you know, our, our risk register will be very like many um, sector organisations, I'm sure, in terms of things that we focus on. Um, and COVID would have an interplay with all of those. But we were very clear that we needed to be, be sure that we were addressing and sort of monitoring our underlying risk in the way that we always would, whilst recognising that we had this activity going on over the top all the time. So we did we did run them in, um, in parallel. Um, we activated our sort of uh, our business continuity, our highest level business continuity straight away now in the early days that meant that the gold team which is basically the exec team were meeting yeah. three times a day okay. and then with the silver and bronze um underneath that and that was very much focused around that covid risk register which you know let's face it it was focused on the tactical and the operational particularly in the early days when we were getting you know there was one day in particular i remember where um, the guidance changed four times in 24 hours and we were having to kind of simulate that and, and get that back out again um, and even now we're seeing even though the frequency of that kind of guidance is, is less it tends to come out on a Friday night which is, yeah. which, is, which, is which is great so I think we the, the way we maintain the focus was by having that separate um, uh, Covid register but acknowledging that there were some linkages across to the main strategic risk register. I mean, it's interesting when we looked at you sort of we always ask people about the top five risks that, that people identify. And you know, for the last couple of years, sort of landlords, health and safety has very much been the key risk and, and, and uh, probably for obvious reasons. But, it, but it's always been there, I think, for most housing associations. This year, we saw government policy risk become something that kind of shot to closer to the top. And, I wouldn't have said that was surprising, but I, but nevertheless, I'm not sure I'd, I'd have picked up that that was one of the top two risks. So if you've got a view on why that might be. I suspect, and I can only put my own perspective on this, I suspect it's, it's the interplay between those two things that you've just described. Okay. So we're always very conscious of making sure, you know, our primary concern is making sure that our, our buildings and services are safe and secure for the people that live in them and, and use them. Um, I suppose there's a sense in which, particularly post Grenfell and other incidents, that policy and legislation um, th and that consumer focus, all of those things are going to lead more to placing more demands on that on that health and safety and, and, and a greater degree of compliance. So I suspect that those two are, are very, very closely linked. Okay, I agree with that. And I also think perhaps people had, you know, I guess maybe just a white paper, so she has a white paper in their mind as well and, and, um, and, and those other things. So, um, yeah, maybe there'll be more of that to come as we go through the next year. But it was it was quite striking how it moved. I thought yeah. uh, as well. The feeling that the, there are the sort of the, there are the um, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, it's the known knowns, the known yeah. unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And we've got various things falling into that category. So things around compliance, uh, the, the greater focus on consumer um, decarbonisation, yeah. um, all of these things which are around and and. You know, we, we're in a closed loop, aren't we, of, 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 yeah. of funding and all of that sort of thing. So under, understanding how all that plays out is uh, is definitely up there in terms of that strategic level risk register. I mean, the decarbonisation piece, I think, is really important, actually. And it's the first year of, you know, we've done this for four years now. And it's the first year you start to see people comment on that. Um, still not yet there as a top five risk or a top priority, but you can see it's just moving up. And yeah. I guess my own view is if we do this again next year, it will have come up again further because my yeah. sense is that's going to be hugely challenging for the sector and I'm sure for Anchor Hanover. Very much so. Very much so. It's very much on our agenda. One of the other sort of angles we looked at this in the context of, you know, the, everyone's had to do things differently, as you say, and, and a lot of that was immediate crisis response and, and let's just make sure we can do what we have to do. And I think you move into the next phase of, well, that's become a bit more normal. And now we're coming out of it, hopefully at some point into next year, about into you know, our world again. What a, is that an opportunity for you to sort of think about doing things differently or uh, um, what are those opportunities? I think? thought for a moment there you were going to say the new normal. No, I stopped myself, Sarah. I stopped myself. <laughs> I know we've all we've all uh, we all check ourselves now uh, internally when we say that. Um, absolutely. Um, I think that 
you see it across all sectors, don't you, that um, to an extent what's happened here, while none of us would have wanted this to happen, it has precipitated, accelerated moves, changes that were happening anyway. It's just made them happen a lot faster. If I look back to my background in retail, for example, that's probably yeah. the, the, the biggest single example of that. Um, I think certainly from the perspective of our organisation, we had the advantage that we'd already embraced agile working um, yeah. a great deal. Um, so workplace, I mentioned, that's a really key uh, thing for us. So although we did go into that crisis management, we were starting from a pretty good place already. So um, and that isn't to uh, underestimate the, the Herculean efforts of the, of the IT team, which were, were fantastic and, and got us uh, completely agile within 10 days, which was remarkable. Yeah. I think what that did do, it, it really challenged our assumptions, though. So there'd always been, I think, a, 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 an implicit assumption that um, the closer you got to the transactional teams, the more likely you were to always have them sitting in an office collectively being managed where you could see them and of course what this has proved is that actually when you think about it those teams are those where you can see productivity very effectively through systems and that have really challenged our perceptions that, that and uh, that is really exciting to me because I think uh in terms of EDI for example and equality diversity and inclusion yeah. all of a sudden some barriers to entry in some of those roles where people had caring responsibilities or other responsibilities, that, that has been swept away. We, we, we can now open those roles to, to other people. So I think that's really exciting. Um, we were talking about decarbonisation. Of course, that isn't only about building, it's also about travel. Yeah. Our travel bill is a fraction of what it was. Now, clearly, yeah. if you look at our care colleagues and our housing colleagues, that will return inevitably for the rest of us. Probably not. You know, we have found these other ways of working, uh, which are which are beneficial to, I think, to, to, to us and to the people that we're looking after, which is great. Yeah, I definitely, I agree with all of that. And I, I think, you know, that's probably, as you said, I think that's true across many, if not all sectors, actually, that, that, that kind of, a, that focus on productivity, how people are productive and happy, I think, is, is a really interesting conversation now. And I think perhaps, you know, I work in professional services and we, you know, we have, you know, rows of desks in offices sometimes and, and people come in and, and I suspect we're going to take a view that actually maybe that's not how we need to work going forward. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to set their own view of how they want to work. And I think that's really exciting. Actually. Mm. We What we're looking at now is this kind of idea of planned spontaneity because what we do recognise we miss is those water cooler yeah. moments. Yeah. Now, I know that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but so in our um, offices, we're looking at the layout and we're making it more, um, some areas more hub space, meeting spaces for when we're allowed to do that again, which will be great. But that kind of, those kind of more informal bringing together thinking spaces um, uh, as well as, and rather than, as you say, just those kind of rows and rows of desks yeah. uh, for that nine to five job. The spontaneity, spontaneity sounds great, Sarah, it has to be said, because it's very yeah. hard to be spontaneous through a computer screen, I think, so. Yeah. Yeah. I guess my last sort of question really is around sort of projected into the future and, and you know, if, if this was, you know, God forbid, if this was ever to happen again, I guess, and, and I, what would the organisation, is there anything the organisation would do differently, you think? Um, I think we would continue to build on the foundations that have served us so well uh, now. Okay. Um, so, again, there, there, there isn't going to be a going back to normal as normal was. Um, I think we will recognise the benefits of greater agility. Um, yeah. I think we all understand now the, 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 the realities of the sector that we work in and the advantages that that gives us. So I think initially... Um, obviously, everybody reacted with uh, the fear that income would be affected, that we'd have problems managing our cash flows. And then, of course, it only takes a moment to think, well, actually, for us, when we already as a sector, we invest so much money in property works, for example, yeah. in a period of time when you're not able to deliver those property works, you're not going to have a cash flow challenge. The, what then becomes the challenge is how you manage that unwind. And I think that's the bit that we all need to focus on going forward. So when we have these short, sharp shocks, it's the implications for the future. So if I look to my organisation, inevitably, um, although thankfully we haven't been hit uh, particularly badly, we do have lower occupancy in our care homes. Yeah. That will continue to have um, an impact on income for a period of time uh, after the period when hopefully we can get back to work and doing all those planned property work. So it's understanding those dynamics, I think will be, it will be really interesting in the future. Uh, 
And having said that was my last question, I obviously do have one more, which is <laughs> one of the things in the barometer that we were really pleased to see was, I guess, thinking about development and, and adding adding accommodation and housing and, and uh, in terms of the demand that they were there. And you quite rightly mentioned the demographics, I guess, which are always going to be pushing uh, that way for an organisation like Ancana. But what impact... Uh, sorry, what I was going to say is the confidence that came through still for one that actually, you know, yes, it's been tough, but if I look into the medium term, we're still very committed to, to that development programme. I assume that remains the case for Anchor Hanover. Uh, definitely. And um, quite remarkably, really, and I suppose it's a testament to my exec colleagues and to the board, um, we got our next round of strategic plans signed off uh, in March. So when all this was starting to unfold and there was so much uncertainty, really, uh, yeah. at that point, but absolutely remain committed to that uh, delivery of additionality um, in, in all parts of our business. So in terms of home ownership, um, uh, rental products and in care homes, we are absolutely committed to growth in all those areas. And that's unchanged. Thank you, Sarah. That's really helpful and a really interesting insight, I guess, into uh, Ankara and the way the year has been. And, and I guess the themes that came out to me is there's a, yeah, the resilience of the organisation in the way that you were able to respond. And, and I guess this sort of confidence in your own stability as an organisation, there remains, actually, you've got options and, and there are still things you can do focused into the long term of your strategy rather than just that kind of immediate crisis management piece that we all had to do irrespective of what role or sector we're working in. Absolutely and uh, just a, so I suppose a final point for me would it be remiss of me not to um, take the opportunity to praise our frontline colleagues who yeah. um, my, my admiration for them already knew no bounds but seriously through through this through this year um, they, they are absolutely remarkable and we owe everything to them. Yeah absolutely and um, thank you Sarah and then um, I uh, really appreciate you finding the time to talk to me today. Um, we'll bring that to a close. For those who want to know a bit more about the barometer and some of the things we've talked about, uh, please do go to our website uh, at bdo.co.uk. You'll be able to see links to the barometer uh, and uh, a bit more detail. And, and indeed, some other uh, clients talking about the way the year has panned out for them too. So uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.